we what we try to do is make this a story of individuals, yes. to make a story of, of people of flesh and blood. Yeah. And I think one of the first paintings the visitors will see is this picture by Adam van der Tempel. Come in. This is one of these very ambitious and wealthy merchant families in, in the Dutch Republic, let's say mid 17th century. And it's, I think it's quite amazing to see how this man, David Leo, who traded with Russia, um, presented himself together with his spouse and his five children, well, just in. in more like a green environment. Yeah. And what I love is the way they play music. Yes. They all play yes. music. They all, they all. And it, it's a kind of an add to the family. Huh? It's yeah. about harmony. If, yes. you, if you live a harmonious life, you play music. That's the idea. So it gives also a message in that line. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even possible to identify uh, the, the, ah, the, the music, the music they're, they're playing. playing. Ah. It's a, a, early 17th century Italian composer and yeah. it's and they're all just facing towards us yeah. except the youngest, yes, the youngest who is a tiny the little boy is a toy in, the, in, in his hand <laughs> yeah. and he is just playing around and he's got this kind of airbag around yeah. his head which was quite common in the 17th century really? for little children if they would bump against oh, tables so, okay so yeah. not to hurt themselves yeah. but even in a, in a formal painting like this, they could incorporate these kind yeah. of techniques. But in my opinion, a painting like this is well stands for what this exhibition is about. It's yes. about these people. Yes. in the 17th century you could choose for two different options or you would um, well, order or commission a family portrait like we just saw or you would <coughs> ask for individual portraits of yeah. you and your spouse and all of the children and that's what we're seeing with this group of 10 family portraits from a private collection that really adds I think yeah. to the exhibition yes, very much so. And it shows how, in this case, three different artists, Gerard de Borg, uh, Paulus Lezire and uh, Kasper Netscher, together worked on this kind of family ensemble. Mm -hmm. And you see the, uh, the, 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 elderly, the other boys, but also the young kids, they're just standing there with all of these kind of attributes yes. and referring to their age. There were many. There were many, Eight, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which was quite typical, I think, for yeah. Dutch families in the 17th century. Yeah. Large families, yeah. five, six, seven, up to 13, 14 children. But if you have to consider also the life, lifespan of the people in the 17th yeah. century. Yeah. Yeah. The average of uh, life time was not very long. No, I think it was about 60, 65 yes, probably. mostly. And, uh, but it were these people who, who made well, let's say the wealth and international activities of the Dutch possible. Yeah. Um, what is extremely unique is that you sometimes, in this case, um, have two paintings together with a part of a costume of the yeah. original yeah. Uh, people being portrayed. And that's what we're seeing here. So this man and wife um, being portrayed together, she's holding her wedding gloves and then you see the gloves over here. Amazing. And it's amazing. 
how close can you come yeah, to no. history? No. It's so we we immediately I think um, in connection with with the lady and yes immediately yeah but really well to do and even these gloves show yeah. how well embroidered they were very old fashioned in the way they are dressed yeah. with this kind yes. of what we call milestone or millstone yes, color millstone color um, which is not the original name but it's but it gives us an idea how people dressed up in in the early 17th century and this artist Nicolas Piquenoy he was one of these very productive and prolific portrait painters but probably the most renowned are Rembrandt and uh, Frans Hals. Of course. May I ask you what is that uh, arms, uh, uh, the coat of arms here yeah. on both paintings? Does it mean anything? Yeah, Should absolutely. It mean, yes. It's a coat of arms that's referring to his family. His family. And the same yeah. with her. So every Do we know uh, which family they were? Yeah, they are from a um, very well to do Amsterdam family. And uh, uh, gaining also quite a lot of money thanks to international trade. And these pictures have become part of a family portrait gallery. I see. So but uh, considering the lack of having an aristocracy in that time uh, in Amsterdam, usually we are used to see that coat of arms for yeah. for the aristocracy, yeah. for the yeah. noble fam families. Yeah. So how does it come that they also that, that uh, the families had their coat of arms, although they were not royals nor uh, yeah. aristocrats? Yeah. Some came from nobility, so some, so some uh, had this background. Still that background. Yeah, but they were not that important anymore yes, like they uh, were I before. So, but so they kept. They kept, they and kept it was this nobility. middle class that, yeah. that really yeah, well yeah. got to power. And this is also what we see in this picture, for example. Her name is Marit Gevoort. She was the spouse of a Harlem uh, mayor, a burgomaster. And, uh, She's sitting here, 62 years old, it says, yeah. up here, yeah. in 1639, uh, very solid, with, her, yes. with the Bible, yes, in her see the Gospels in her hand, and again with this, with this collar yeah. around her neck. Um, and well, she shows off to be, let's say, the cornerstone of the family. Yeah. Yes. But what I like very much about this wall is how we have Frans Hals as the most prolific Harlem portrait yeah. painter and Rembrandt van Rijn, probably the most well-known yeah. ambassador of Dutch culture yes. in the 17th century, together on one wall. This is absolutely unique. And looking at this, seeing how these artists have portrayed ladies more or less in the same way, but at the other side, they look completely different. And for, yeah. my, for me, this installation shows how a portrait is always a kind of, well, a meeting, a rendezvous, between a painter and a sitter. So you always recognize the, the physiognomy, so the, the face of a person, but also the style of an artist. Yes. And Frans Halsey is very, well, the, the, the artist of the swift brush strokes. It's very fastly painted. He was, let's say, the modern artist of his days. Yeah. Um, and when you see how he just needed a couple of brush strokes to just to, well, to, to shape the face of this figure, and then in comparison to Rembrandt, who focused much more on light. So it's not the brush strokes, yeah. yeah. but it's how uh, light. Well, it's very warm light. Exactly. Um, functions to, well, to give space to this individual. And I think it's amazing to see how he really is working from the background to the foreground, even with highlights here on the nose, yeah. for example. And you see even the wrinkles yeah. under her eyes. So it's not idealized. She is a yes, like very person very of very flesh and blood. Very, very interesting. Yeah. 
and she, she was the spouse of a, a beer brewer in Rotterdam. Oh. And her husband has also been portrayed, and he is in the Los Angeles County Museum oh, yes. today. So they, they got apart. They got <laughs> apart, unfortunately. I think it, it were the, these Dutch burgers who lived in that typical tiny little country in being the Netherlands at the sea. And what we try to do with the next uh, group of paintings to show how this country looks like. And it's, I think everyone who's ever visited the Netherlands knows that it's a, it's a flat country. Yes. And it's when you, when you arrive at Schiphol Airport, for example, you are below sea level. Yes. People would not notice, but they are, actually. And then... And here we can see also their fight against the water. Yeah. You're not just yeah. doing the yeah. fortification of the yeah. soil. Yeah. You're completely right, and this, this is, I mean, water gave power and wealth to the Netherlands, but it took also, yeah. and it took lives, and it's, even today, it's this kind of struggle with water, since we are, we are this, well, such a low-situated country at the North Sea, and then windmills, of course, of course. as being Very typical. one of these typical aspects. There is just one region in the country um, where you find some hills at the, in the area around the German border, in the area of the city of Nijmegen. And this is where um, Albert Kuyp made this picture. Yeah. Um, just a few men standing there with their horses, just resting yes. while they're on a journey from one place to another. Knowing the flat, uh, country and seeing the mountains, uh, it seems on the first sight as impossible uh, how to judge this painting. Is it been a fan fantasy painting or is it a reality? But if you say near to the German border, so they, maybe yeah. they were some mountains. Well, it's manipulated, yes, to be manipulated, honest. Manipulated. So, so what this artist does is he, he went there he made drawings. This is the first generation of artists really well, going out um, of their workshops and drawing in the field. Yeah. And, but what he did is he really um, exaggerated these points. Okay. So they are not that high as they are in the painting. So he dramatized the, the landscape a bit. And then with this kind of southern Mediterranean light that you would never find in the Netherlands, no. But giving well a certain new this atmosphere. This is maybe what he was longing for. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, well, and, and painters like Rauhmann, for example, he is also one who, I mean, he takes you with him to one of these tiny little glimpses yeah. of, well, the Dutch landscape. Yeah. What I think that's typical for, for our country is the way yes. we are very fond of yes. ice. This is what we have been used to see, the frozen rivers and the ice skating on it. Yeah. I mean, there's probably no other country in the world where people no. are so much bound up with, no. with winter as the, no. the Dutch are. And it's funny, as you know, as no one else is, I mean, once it starts freezing in the Netherlands, yeah. the Dutch get totally crazy, mm -hmm. since they, re they have this absolute urge to go on the ice. They yeah. need to go <laughs> skating. And even in the 17th century, it, well, it, it happened in the same way. The same way. And this is what Art van der Neer, uh, this artist, shows, and how people are ice skating, they're on the sledges, for example, playing golf, which is the forerunner of yeah. uh, golf and ice yeah. hockey. So, everyday life at the ice fields, on the rivers and the lakes in the Netherlands, where, well, you could say classes disappeared. People yes. were all together, which is quite a nice aspect. Yeah. 
probably Jan van Gooyen is the most um, active uh, landscape painter of the 17th century. We, today we know over 1,200 paintings by him, which is incredible. Yeah, and this is one of the, the largest he ever made, one of the, um, but we know that he painted these paintings in, in a day, probably. So with, he knew exactly how to, to paint it on forehand, make use of the drawings he had made on his journeys through the country, and it's mostly in a very, um, let's say, small palette, so you see just brown and green tones of color. It's not very, you, know, you don't see very rich uh, uh, motifs of yes. color. It's very tonal in the way it's been painted. It seems very realistic too. It's quite modest housings. Yeah. Modest people yeah. Yeah. struggling through the life, yeah. the everyday life. That's right. With an inn here, for example, yes. where this chariot is just um, stopping over just to rest on the on one of their journeys through yeah. the country. But when you see this, and then for, com for in comparison, this picture over here by Adriaan van der Velde, showing a Dutch family in the um, in the Dutch landscape, it's well, it's totally different, isn't it? With yes, very yeah, right. Other kinds of colors yes. and uh, also a different social. Uh, state of the yeah. family too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the family with, um, I mean, the man and wife standing over there with yeah. their little kids, and their maid servant over there with, with a tiny little yes. baby. And, and he was someone who painted lots of figures for other landscape painters. Oh, yeah. He was very famous for that in the 17th century. Is this the painter himself? Be good? Probably not, Probably but it's, we, we don't know who it is, but it, it's definitely a portrait of a family, yes, not, of course. Not, not identifiable. standing, actually standing at the, the harbour side to wait for ships coming from overseas, bringing new goods, and you see a fisherman's wife over here, for example, uh, people carrying all different kinds of, of well, boxes and yeah. stuff. Um, that, that was the place to be, and to see how, well, all of these different goods were just brought into Amsterdam, being one of the central markets and gates to Europe in those days. This, this is this feel I, I feel when I'm in Istanbul. You're, oh, the, yes. you're the gate between East and East West. And, West yes. and that was what Amsterdam was in the 17th century. And then they made, well, I think the largest um, city construction ever up to the 17th century it was being realized in Amsterdam. Yeah. These, the, the canals, yes. these kind of, well, uh, circular ground plan of the city uh, with all of these well, very expensive houses where people made their own old city palaces. Which are existing in our days too. Yeah. Many of them. Yeah, still. But this, this the, du the Dutch uh, or the Amsterdam canals have become uh, UNESCO cultural heritage mm -hmm. uh, last year. And, uh, but it's lovely to see, I think. It's yes. how, I mean, you have to imagine that were the people living in these houses who commissioned the, the paintings. And, and in these houses, you find sometimes collections of over 100 to 200 paintings. It's mm -hmm. incredible, to, isn't it? And with the city hall again, it's all this kind of the bus, the, the activity, um, cultures meeting in front of the, the city yes. hall of Amsterdam, which is the royal palace today. Yes. It is amazing to know that the same buildings are existing in our days too. 
the city called yeah. the Canals, the houses. It's, it gives me such a familiarity with the past. Yeah, yeah it's nice that you mentioned that. I yes. think that's something we still feel. Yes, yes, yes. And it's, I think for the Rijks Museum it's wonderful to I mean, have a, such a rich collection of Dutch artworks that were partly made in the city that still exists in the same yes. way, as you say. So when you visit Amsterdam, you look at the paintings, but when you leave the museum building, I mean, you walk into that world that's, exactly. that's still comparable to, exactly. to, to the pictures. Yeah. Well, lots of craftsmen were organized in guilds, for example, these artists uh, over here by Jan de Braai, and, and what we wanted to do here is to show how well, all different kinds of craftsmen and uh, people selling um, fishes, for example, um, your groceries, yeah. a baker, a, someone uh, making uh, dresses, for example, yes. were all working in that same, in that same city. So it's all about, I think, activity, the way everybody added to, in one way or another, to, uh, to this great uh, prosperity. There are many Muslims at the time in Amsterdam, maybe the merchants, yeah. who were coming from the yeah. East. Yeah. So you, you would meet quite some uh, Muslim merchants in the city. Some people were based in Amsterdam or stayed there for a couple of years and then leaving. Um, but it was open and people were free to go yeah. and to practice their religion. Um, and so did the, the, well, the Dutch themselves. And it's interesting to see how also in these private houses people uh, hung their religious artworks, as, as yes. we see with the paintings of the Vandal School. For Sometimes it's it's quite nice to see how uh, people wearing turbans yes. were used as a kind of models to for the east for the east indeed yes. in these kind of religious paintings. Yes. But this is um, um, the, the, the presentation of the, uh, yes, the, the, uh, the so called the three kings exactly the yeah three kings. so um, it's the, the class chart yeah. But what's lovely, in my opinion, is to see how this artist called Hendrik de Brugge, who worked in Italy for quite a long time, depicted this little Jesus yes. baby. I mean, he's not idealized. No, no. He's, he's not. Like a, a newborn baby. Exactly. The wrinkles, etc. Still uh, not recovered from the birth. No. And it, so it's so lifelike, and, yeah. and that's where he is. It's not idealized, yeah. nothing. It's just a sh child of flesh yeah. and blood. And sometimes you see how they incorporate these very precious objects, like yes. um, like um, uh, these kind of chalices, for example. And what we've tried to do is to present a, a oh, same yeah. kind of object oh, yeah. here, yes. to make your visitors aware of yeah. well how these objects also functioned in their own days, and well now are also visible in the painting. Yes, all the others paintings did. They, they projected the pieces of their time to back uh, to the to the old times, as yeah. we see on this painting. Yeah. This was all that they knew. Yeah. So Absolutely. Were, sorry, yeah. It, it is so nice yeah. to get to know it. And then here, there three random artworks yeah. in the room. Right. I think this wall makes immediately how marvelous he was as an artist, yeah. as a printmaker, as a well, one, someone who was conceiving uh, prints, but also as a very young painter. And this is all what he made when he was just in his twenties.
so he, he was he was so talented as yeah, a artist. genius, yes. Absolutely. And it's the same thing again. I mean you just talked about the turbans and there you see yes. uh, also, even here, uh, but the man, the violinist, the cello says on, on him. Yeah. It is really... You know that in that time, during this time, the Orient uh, was symbolized as the Turks. This was uh, because of the encounter, this, this were because uh, they didn't go so far further, yeah. so therefore, uh, the Turks were the symbols for the East, for the Far, yeah. for an Oriental fashion. And then it's nice to see how Rembrandt used these kinds yes. of models um, to give life to his compositions. So it's, I mean, with a painting like this, the, the, the close connections between the two countries is just one arm length away. The same is happening here with the Arte Gelder, who was the last pupil of Rembrandt. And next to it you see Robert Flink, who was his first pupil. And he, he had quite a workshop. He was a firm with sometimes over 40 uh, students uh, working in his house. Flink or Flink? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then yeah. some, some of them just painted well, his artworks and then he signed them. But it was a kind of like a a workshop business. production. Okay, like yeah. But this is, I mean, Rembrandt is, of course, the man of these tiny little stories, very intimate relations between figures. And you see how Robert Flint this took over. I mean, this is this very emotional um, uh, relation here um, Isaac blessing Jacob as part of this Old Testamentical story. But it's lovely to see how it's uh, how it's happening and how this artist worked it out and really tried to focus on the emotional relations. Since, in fact, his wife tries to mischief him by presenting not the eldest son to him but the youngest, mm -hmm. and it should have been his older brother who became the most important inheritor of his father. But he was, he could not see very well. So that's why, so he was mostly blind, so to speak. And this is why she tried to get him into that, and they just tried to mischief them. And this is a kind of, well, painting that um, and could also be read as a negative example. Of course. So, Maybe on the expression of their faces, you, after hearing your story, we can uh, see that the man is really near to die and uh, can't see, he's tired, yeah. he doesn't have any power, and then how she is whispering to his eyes, uh, yeah. to his ears. Yeah, absolutely. Something. So the story is full, yeah. it's perfect. It's going to lie, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And the same with this painting by Rembrandt. Well, sometimes you've got the feeling that you're just looking into a tiny little, well, particular corner of a Dutch town. This, this girl, she's just leaning out of the window, and then two peacocks are, well, just hanging. They've been killed, and they're just hanging to get the meat ready to be prepared afterwards. But to, to make this the main subject of a painting is quite exceptional. Yes. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't find it in any other country in Europe, I think, no. outside the Netherlands. No. By the way, peacock, can the, the flesh of peacock, is it eat, how does it taste? I never heard that peacock still be eaten. I've never eaten them no, at all. I never, so. So. But they use the, um, also use the feathers for example. Well, the feathers, yes, the feathers. Uh, Maybe they have been killed because of the feathers only. And sometimes they have these kind of cakes where they use peacocks on top of it. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah, that yes. was quite nice. It's, with, with Rembrandt and Rembrandt School, you also have this idea of um, the way paintings can act as a kind of mirror of nature. 
And sometimes you even don't know, am I looking at something real or not? And this picture would function much better without a frame, I think. It's a tiny, or a young girl just leaning out of the window with these apricots down here. Yes. And it's a kind of talk life idea. Yes. So the artist is playing with us, with our eyes, fooling us. Are we looking at an actual girl leaning out of the window or has it been painted? Do you know, this looks also quite a... Yes, it's, it's, it's pointing to the east. Yeah. The cushion, yes. Yeah, this is probably one of the greatest highlights of yes. the collections of the Rijksmuseum, but also of the exhibition right now. Um, Vermeer was an artist living in the city of Delft. As far as we know, today he made about 35 pictures, just 35 pictures exist. And this is one of the very few. Are we meant to see what's happening over there or not? But we are eyewitnesses. I, eyewitnesses, yes. And then you see the paintings in the background, where we yeah. know that a painting of a ship on water, on the sea, mm -hmm. could be... It's an indication that about someone in the park. Exactly. And, and the ship was, or the sea was always standing for love, and a choppy sea could yes. sometimes be not a very, yes. let's say... Yes. good news. Yes. Good news. Um, so she's really at the moment of, as you just mentioned, yeah, what, what's going on here? Is it good news or bad news? And Vermeer is a master, I think, in just depicting these tiny little moments of time. He's, he's like an art, a film director, so yes. choosing these particular exactly. moments. Always light from the left. Um, every single motif seems to have its, well, its and own this function. Peter de Hoog was some of the artists. Uh, well, he knew, Vermeer knew and who was working in Delft and in Amsterdam at the same time. And it's got the same feel, I think. It's also, mm -hmm. this is a backyard of a, one of these brick stone Dutch houses. People are sitting, just chatting a little bit, a girl and a, and a young man. Well, it's clear what's going on here. This is, this, these are these yes. kind of love dogs yes. sitting yes. there um, in, in just one of these Dutch houses. Okay. Yeah. you just said he is he's a real master Rembrandt the way you know, he really gives life to this yeah. tiny little composition with the grandmother the mother and the child just sitting outside well in front of the door yeah. of an average house it's a beautiful drawing this is one of these drawings that are normally not, not seen so yeah. we, we keep them in storage and... Yes, and, and they are yeah. very rare. It happens very rare that you yeah. get them. Yeah. Yeah, with these painting painters, so Gabriel Metzu or uh, Gerard de Borg, we've got, I think, nice examples of artists showing different classes yes. in, in the Netherlands. Uh, servants here, she's fanning a, a cat, but that, these are the well-to-do. And he, his nickname is the Master of Saturn. And it's not without a reason, I think, the way he really depicts yes. this kind of material. But what are we looking at? I mean, it's again a girl and a young boy. Is he a soldier or not? What's her function? The lady who's drinking in the middle? Is she connecting the two? Is she the mother? Or yeah. is she the matchmaker? Probably. The matchmaker. And um, so it's interesting to find out what actually uh, Gerard de Borg, the painter of this picture, wants to express to us. And 
What I like very much is the way he has portrayed her from yeah. the back. So it's just her, her figure yeah. and not her identity that's no. been shown to us as beholders. In front of a bed, which is in the background, um, and then he is just looking or gazing up to her. And what kind of conversation is going on here? We don't know, but I, I'm sure that a 17th century Dutch beholder would immediately understand of course, what this was person. about. And she's drinking something yeah. out of a glass. Yeah. And here he has a glass. Yeah. I think that's, that's a nice thing that's that we nice did together, didn't we? Very nice combination. Yeah. Exactly. And also these artists um, themselves, they really wanted to portray themselves in a, well, in a, in a very high class way. They, they became, sometimes they became uh, uh, really high up um, persons. And this artist called Adrian van der Berg, he was a painter who made career in, um, in Germany and became one of the most uh, prolific painters at the um, well, the, the court of Johann Willem van der Pals. And he's showing himself here in a kind of classical dress with a medal, with the portrait of the German king on top of it. And then you see his wife and one of his children in the painting that he's made. He's one of these artists from what we call the Leiden School. Actually, he was from Rotterdam. But he is one of these few artists really showing, let's say, the climax of Dutch realism. Yeah. It's almost impossible to identify the brush strokes. It's so flat, it's just yes. as if it's a photograph. Yes. started to, to go out hunting and these three paintings give us a wonderful idea I think of what hunting was all about. He is quite amazing, the portrait of this young man by Carlo Dujardin and actually in this in the sleeves yes. he made use of real gold leaf. So we did research on the pigments he used and there was actually gold in that. So which says a lot about this and that's the really importance of these kind of paintings. They were very expensive as portraits. And he's posing really like an aristocrat. He absolutely. Yeah. And then young ladies, well, showing a dead hair. Um, these were kinds of still lives that people really liked and paid quite some money for. But still life is one of these other genres and aspects that we've included in the, in the exhibition too. Uh, from the very modest still lives up to the world. Yeah. Well, I think it's Adrian Koorte. He was a school teacher in Middelburg in, in the province of Zeeland. And he, he was a school teacher and a painter. And this is what he just did for himself. He has got a very small earth. It's asparagus, nothing else, just asparagus on a table. That's what they liked. What they liked on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you can't imagine that this, this in any other country no. than no. the Netherlands. No. It's so simple. And it, the nice thing is that these kinds of paintings are so in fashion today. Mm -hmm. They go really well with the modern interior. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, another still life, also with Chinese pottery in it. 
So the Dutch really like to show off how hey, they were active on these international trades, the trade routes. What I like here is how we were able to show a, a, a so-called Roma, as these kind of glasses are uh, called, um, as being painted by Peter Klaas, um, is also yeah, yeah. in this uh, showcase. And it gives us, a, I think, we, us as visitors, a good idea of how these glasses function yes. for wine. And then we've got Peter de Ring, so where Peter Klaas is quite modest. This is something that really shows yeah. off. With all of these different fruits and, and the lobster in the foreground. And again, silver work here, yes. Chinese uh, pottery. This, this is something really to, yes. to show off your, uh, exactly. your wealth. But abundance could sometimes also lead to drunken people. And yeah. that's what we see here. How these, in this picture by Jan Steen, he's, he's the storyteller of Pure Sun. He's someone who, who can tell these tiny little stories about, um, well, let's say, low life figures. And these are the, the negative examples. So never do, never behave no, like they no, do. No, no. With the warning finger. With the warning finger, indeed. I've never used this, but I would be curious oh, yeah. to do it. It's a, it's a cup with the windmill on top of it, and they use it as a kind of game. So what happened is you should turn it upside down, so the windmill is, is down. down. Then you would fill it with wine or beer, probably wine most of the time. Then you would blow on the, the staircase, ah. the windmill, or the, the it, would turn. it would start turning, ah. and then you would drink up to the moment that it would stop. So this was quite fast, ah. and then people got drunk. So if you turn uh, upside down, then you drink, and beat your yeah. Uh, yeah. and then the And this is Jan Steen too. So this drunken man, he's leaving the pub and on the boat back home to his village. And they're all misbehaving, yeah, as you see. Yeah. And people really liked this in the 17th century. If someone had a painting like this... Like a joke. Like a yeah, joke. absolutely. They were, laughing, they were laughing. Yeah. I think this gallery is showing the maritime power of the Dutch. Yeah. So it's the nucleus of your building, yeah. but also the center of what the Dutch Republic yeah. was all about. The, 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 the sea gave power to the Dutch and wealth, but took also quite a lot of lives of course. at the seas, but also because of the floods. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to see how quite a lot of artists focused on, well, painting maritime uh, subjects. This artist is Willem van der Velde. He is one of the most exceptional painters because he uh, just drew these pictures um, on top of an oil paint uh, ground. But this is ink, it's pen and ink. Yeah, yeah. He was very exceptional in that way. And he is probably the first embedded reporters we know. Um, he, he really ran to the frontier. Yeah. He, he, was, he was there when these kind of uh, battles were taking place. No, I, I, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, and made a lot of drawings and these drawings he used back in his workshop as a starting point for these paintings. They were called um, pen drawings or pen paintings and he became quite famous for that. And he was also quite a good uh, letter writer. And we know from some of his letters that he describes really who he was, how he was sitting in his tiny little boat in between all of these huge um, warships and then he described how he went with his tiny little boat in between these burning ships and he said it was like just moving into an oven, so warm and dangerous, dangerous it would be. 
the, the interesting aspect of these kind of battles in front of the Dutch coast, first between the Dutch and the Spaniards uh, yeah. during the Eighty Years' War, <coughs> up to 1648 and then from 1652 onwards with the English um, were also kind of events to the Dutch public. So they were standing on the dunes, next to the sand, next to the co coast, and just watching these battles, just sitting there at a sunny Sunday afternoon. Like it, it, it's hard yeah, to understand. It's hard, isn't? To, hard to imagine. Hard yeah. to imagine. But he's, he's exceptional in a way, and we've restored these paintings, especially for in, in preparation of this exhibition, and taken off a very thick layer of varnish, and now it's possible to admire the yeah. painting again as it was Beautiful. meant to be. Beautiful. Beautiful. He's, he's a member of a, a family of artists, mm -hmm. and his son, Willem van der Velde the Younger, he made these kind of oil paintings, um, and together they were invited by the British king in 1672 to work at the court in London. And um, then they moved over to England. And at a certain moment, he, the British king said, Well, you're not longer allowed to go to the frontier and to the battlefield since it's much too dangerous. And then they stopped. Uh, but they, they really understand how ships look like and how yeah. all of the ropes and, and sails functioned. Um, so it's interesting sometimes to stand in front of these pictures with a sailor, yeah. people who really understand these kind of events and they say, well, it's so lifelike. ship over here with the Virgin on the, uh, yeah. on the back side and then one Dutch ship next to another Spanish ship so they yeah. were standing just well, very close to each other and then firing at each other and sometimes they would even use these uh, burning ships that they would move into the direction of the other ships and would to, to ramp, yeah, to to ramp. ramp. and then it would start to uh, burn uh, burning too. It's nice that we were able to include some drawings yeah. again, I think, since these drawings make you, well, give you the idea of looking over the shoulder of the artist. You're in the yeah. kitchen of the yeah. artist himself almost. And these kind of drawings were made on the spot and then used later on in the workshop for these huge uh, paintings. This is quite a thing. This is a, one of these highly exceptional images of a Dutch artist, in this case Jan Wenix, who depicts an, an embassy of a, a Dutch group of people, in this case in Isfahan in Persia, to, today Iran. And how, well, the Dutch were connected to the, the Iranian or the Persian people in those days, and it makes immediately clear again how internationally oriented the Dutch were. So they were everywhere from South America, Brazil, up to New York, yes. being New Amsterdam in those days, to Australia, Japan, China. Amazing, amazing. And considering the long distances. Yeah, it took them months they, yes. yeah, to get there. That's absolutely, and sometimes they say, well, they, when they had to, to cross the uh, equator, yeah. with these very hot temperatures, it, yeah. was, it was dangerous too. This is again, um, good examples by Jan Lievens, one of these, well, painters, pals, pals of Rembrandt, one of his best friends. He's one of the main competitors of Rembrandt, and the two work together, and they, by this kind of competition, they both went up to a higher level. And Jan Lievens shows here a young boy in, in Ottoman dress, and um, as a kind of what we call a trony, so it's not a portrait. Yeah but it's a picture that shows a person in typical dress um, as a kind of way to study light and the effect of light yeah. on, on the face and on, on, the, on the dress. In a turn, yeah. 
this is also from a private uh, collection, and yes. it's from the same private collection. And I think it's good that we were able to add it again. Yes, it's from. It's the oldest ship model we've got at the Rijksmuseum, dating from 1648. Yeah. Which is an incredible, and it's still in such a good condition. Yeah, it's great. But these ships were very. Um, you, you just needed a couple of people to to make it sail. So it was quite easy for the Dutch with, well, lesser uh, crowds of people to sail the seas. Yeah. And um, they, they were very fast, so they were faster, for example, than Spanish or Portuguese ships. So it was also thanks to, well, let's say the invention of technical equipment yes. that the uh, Dutch were able to um, get the position they, well, they, they got finally. Very nice. And it was about the trade of um, spices. Yeah. Uh, they, so they went to uh, the Far East, to Indonesia, yeah. um, just to, to acquire these kind of spices. And then back home in Amsterdam, pepper and salt were kept in these yeah. very precious objects. So it shows off how these spices were really well esteemed yeah. in the, their own days. If for us it's something that we can just... Well, was it for pepper or for salt? Both. Yeah. It happened for pepper and salt. And the other one? That's for salt. That's for salt. And they, they took all kinds of stuff from abroad, even yeah. exotic birds were brought yes. to the Netherlands, like Melchior de Hondekoter is yeah. presenting here, with his pelican. Yeah, and, then and the other flamingos, yeah. and others. But they were, yeah, well, there were kind of um, tiny little zoos where these yes, animals were so kept. Yeah. 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 Well, again, one of these admirals, Art van Ness, yeah. um, portrayed by Bartholomeus van der Helst, who was another portrait painter, together with his spouse. She, the, her costume is highly expensive. This is the, probably the most yeah. expensive dress in the whole exhibition. The way she's been portrayed here with her pearls, for example. Yeah, it's very yeah. It's okay. yeah. very slim yeah. Um, uh, dress. Corset and uh, yeah. And this is the drama, I think, the, yes. the, the drama of ships at sea, where lots of sailors lost their lives, and again becoming a subject painted by Ludolf Backhuizen, which you see these heavy clouds. Huh? It's, I mean, storm and rain is approaching, and um, well, they are in the middle of they are trouble. Not far from the coast. No, but it's it's helpless. Near Gibraltar, we know, and it's an actual event that really happened to, to a Dutch fleet in the 17th century. But most of the time it was about festivities and people were happy. Like Lieve van Schuyer is depicting here. So it's, yeah. it's King Charles uh, moving back to England in 1650. Where is he on the boat? Here he is, he is on the boat and he is here in front of the city of Rotterdam. Uh, with all of these people paying respect yeah, to him, yeah. and um, it's the well, it's it's the beginning of the reinstallation of the English monarchy here. So it's nice to see also these very close bounds between different countries, mm -hmm. not only in Europe but also um, all over the globe, and that this makes it after the wars, after yeah. the wars. Which yeah, yeah. Well, and probably the final aspect is that we are very proud of our Dutch symbol being the tulip. Yeah. But as you know, we we lent it, or <laughs> it's yeah. being borrowed from this the Turkish. This is a friendly message from the east to the west. Yeah. This is how we can symbolize it. It's nice, but it's good to know that. Um, 
I mean, every spring, well, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world visit the Netherlands to see these tulip fields all over. But we know that they, well, originally came from Turkey. Are these tulip fields all over, or mainly I heard on the Kirkenhof? Yeah, Kirkenhof is very famous for that. Like there are others too. There are You find them all over the, mostly the west of the country, in all different shapes, like you see in these pictures, for example. And even in the early 17th century, tulips were extremely um, expensive. And one of the major um, economic crashes in the 17th century worldwide happened thanks to tulip trade. Tulip trade, yeah. I think we had also a similar fate here. The tulip era and there's it's a huge uprising and then the, and then an era, a peaceful era ended up with that tulip ammonia. Yeah. So this yeah. is yeah. this is true. But at least uh, due to you the tulip could be known uh, and could live so long in Europe. And now uh, I think it is also a matter that we rediscovered again the tulip. Again, it is a tulip ammonia in the March, late March, early April here. If you will come to Turkey, you will see plenty of tulips all over. And behind us, there is also a tulip museum will be open now. So next time, we should think of having a small exhibition in the tulip museum, maybe. The mayor might come to you and ask you for it. That's lovely. That's lovely. Well, I hope um, the exhibition will flourish. The exhibition will certainly flourish, and I don't know to find my right words to thank you for giving us that wonderful exhibition for us, for our museum, and for the Turkish public, for the Turkish art lovers. It will be the first time that they are seeing so many, they get to know so many Dutch uh, painters, artists, and uh, I truly believe it will be a great success. I thank you so much. I thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> You're thank very you. welcome. This was a very nice collaboration. Well, thank In you. In the name of my staff and my colleagues, I thank you so much. Well, the Rijksmuseum loves to be an art connects. Art connects, art connects, surely. <laughs>